Is it on audio? Okay. A big hello to all the guests at the InnoFact Show. I'm so delighted to join you to help you find a way. Together, we're going to explore how we can use creative thinking and innovative problem solvings to unlock bold opportunities. So how do we do this? Well, you might think we should start big, but instead, we're going to start small. I just published a new book called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. The principle behind the book is instead of shooting for these giled, uh, giant high-risk moonshots, that can feel overwhelming and out of reach for most of us. Instead, it's around cultivating small daily acts of creativity across your entire organization. It's a more pragmatic approach to driving uh, growth and seizing opportunity. So what is a big little breakthrough? Rather than just talking about them, let me show you one. Imagine that we all jumped on a plane and headed over to London, England. We're walking around London, enjoying the architecture, hustle and bustle of the crowd, Everything is going great until we look down and see this. It turns out that cigarette butt litter is the single biggest environmental challenge in central London. They spend millions of pounds every year trying to clean up the mess with no luck. Enter an everyday innovator named Trewin Resterick. Now you've probably never heard of Trewin. I hadn't heard of him either until I researched him and then ultimately interviewed him for my book. Trewin is an everyday innovator. He's not a big famous celebrity, he's not a billionaire, but he really cared about the environment and decided to do something about it. He decided to create a big little breakthrough. He invents something called the ballot bin, and here's how it works. Imagine that on our trip to London, we enjoyed a nice pint and some fish and chips in a local pub. We walk out into the street, we're about to throw our cigarettes on the ground, but instead, we see this. This ballot bin is asking a simple two-part question. Which is your favorite food, hamburgers or pizza? Encouraging smokers to vote with their butts. I happen to like pizza, I'd insert my cigarette butt, and I can instantly see the tally of who's in the lead. These ballot bins can be configured with any two-part question, which is your favorite sport, or, or um, which, which political party do you support? But the cool thing is that they work. In fact, when ballot bins are installed, they reduce cigarette butt litter by up to 80%. Today, Trywin has built an organization. He has 55 employees. They're deploying these ballot bins in 27 countries around the world. The reason I bring this up, though, is that, to me, this is the essence of what's within all of our grasps. In other words, it didn't require a billion dollars of R&D or 15 PhDs. It was a simple, low-tech solution that worked. Now, you and I could think about some giant breakthrough, and it's hard to imagine ourselves coming up with the idea, but here we could all say, hey, I could have thought of that. And that's the beauty. Big little breakthroughs, everyday innovation, are within the grasp of all of us. And together, let's explore how to bring those ideas to the surface. In working on the book, I actually spent over 1,000 hours researching uh, and preparing for the, for the work. I spent time working, lo looking through neuroscience research, academic research, business research, but I also personally interviewed hundreds of people, people like Trow and Resterick, as well as billionaires and celebrity entrepreneurs and even Grammy award-winning musicians. All of this coalesced into a simple step-by-step -step process that I'll show you today that's going to help you find your way, uncover opportunities, and seize them. Here's the core essence that I'd like you to consider. We're all looking for an edge, and the hospitality industry, which has obviously suffered greatly in this last year with COVID, now we're trying to say, all right, how do we gain our edge? And, and we might be looking outside, but the truth is it might be the inside asset that we all have of human creativity that is the edge that we're looking for. So let's explore how we can bring it to the surface. You might be thinking, why now? Why is this so important today, especially in these challenging times? But what's basically happened with the COVID crisis is that the entire world has hit a giant reset button and patterns have been broken. The way guests arrive at one of your properties, the way that we entertain, the way that we work, the way we sell, the way we eat, the way we love. And when those patterns are broken, it, it, it ensures that we can no longer simply rely on the models of the past and expect the same result. In other words, it's incumbent on all of us as leaders to adopt new changes, to, to, to elevate, to transform, to reinvent, and ultimately to, to deploy our creativity to drive meaningful progress. Don't just take my word for it. 
Recently, the World Economic Forum released their Future of Jobs report. They interviewed dozens of leaders around the world in lots of different industries, including hospitality. And they wanted to understand what are the most important job skills in today's workforce. Here's what they found. Four of the top five most cited needed job skills tie to human creativity. We've got innovation and analytical skills, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, creativity, originality, and initiative. So what we, again, know for sure is that many of these hard skills of the past that we were taught in school, today they become automated, outsourced, uh, and commoditized. Whereas these softer skills are the ones that allow us and our organizations to flourish. Now you might be saying, okay, this is not that groundbreakingly new. I know I need to be more creative. I know we need to drive more innovation, but why aren't we? What's getting in our way? Let's quickly dispel some common myths and then we'll get on taking a look at the mindsets and tactics of the most innovative people, ideas that you can use and put into action right away. But first, what's getting in our way? One myth I hear all the time is that I'm just not that creative or only some people are creative. Here's the truth. The research is crystal clear that all human beings, and I mean all human beings, have enormous reservoirs of creative capacity. We are hardwired to be creative. That's our natural state. Now, we can express it in different ways. Doesn't mean you have to paint on canvas or play a musical instrument. But truthfully, all of us can be creative. Maybe that's the way that we interact with a guest, or we conduct sales, or, or we do customer service. So again, we can find areas inside our daily work to be creative if we really try. Next thing I often hear is that it's only for certain roles. In other words, unless you're in marketing or maybe the CEO, you ought not to be creative. The truth is that we can all be everyday innovators. Again, we can find little uh, ways to uh, inject creative thinking, creative problem solving, inventive approaches to even the most basic mundane aspects of the job. Next thing I often, I often hear is that it only counts if it's big. In other words, it, unless it's a billion dollar idea, it doesn't count. And boy, is that nonsense. In fact, here in the United States, 77% of the gross domestic product of the United States doesn't come from the big, sexy, attention-grabbing innovations. It comes from the little ones. Those small, everyday innovations add up to big things. And last I often hear is that I'd love to be more creative. I wish my organization was more innovative, but we don't have enough resources. We're lacking money or time or support. But once again, let's dispel that myth. The truth is that innovation is free, renewable, and limitless. We can all find ways to be resourceful. And in fact, think about startups for a moment. They don't have a lot of external resources, but they're always able to find their way. And so for us, let's make sure that we're not allowing ourselves to, to be trapped by an excuse of not having enough resources. Truthfully, all of us can find our way with enough creativity. So now that we've dispelled a couple common myths, I want to just show you another example. Because these are the types of innovations that are all around us if we're willing to discover them. Children's Hospital, University of Pittsburgh. Who are their customers? Sick kids and their families. The leaders of the hospital were trying to create a better experience for those kids in the exact same way that many of you are trying to create a better experience for your hospitality guests. So in this case, how do they do it? The obvious approach may be softer pillows, but the big little breakthroughs approach, the everyday innovator approach, these are the window washers. In other words, they dress up the window washers like superheroes. They had to clean the windows anyway. Why not entertain the kids at the same time? And the results were groundbreaking. The kids looked forward to it for days, forgot why they were there in the first place. It really took the pressure of being in this horrible situation off their shoulders. So again, something like this may not make the cover of a magazine, maybe it's not a billion dollar idea, but it worked. And so if you and we in our organizations bring these types of ideas to the surface on a, on a regular basis, high frequency, small ideas, again, they add up to big things. Okay. With all that as the backdrop, what I'd like to do with our time today is take a look at five big ideas, five mindset shifts that you can approach, you can adapt immediately. These are not difficult. You can put them into use. They don't require money. They require a little different thinking though. And I know that you're able to do this. So my hope for you is that you take an open mind and an open heart and think how you can take the five core mindsets of everyday innovators and apply them today along with the rest of your team. Okay? Let's dive in and take a look at the five core mindsets of everyday innovators as we look to find a way. Mindset number one, 
Start before you're ready. You know, many of us, what do we do? We wait. We wait until we get a, a, a directive from the boss. We wait until we have a perfect game plan or, or until there are ideal conditions to start. But there's a risk in waiting, and the risk is that we might lis- miss the opportunity altogether. Instead, innovators of all shapes and sizes around the globe do the opposite. They start before they're ready. They see an opportunity or a challenge, and they just get after it, recognizing that they may not have all the answers. They may not have a perfect game plan. They're certainly going to need to pivot and adapt and, and to, to shift their approach in the context of changing conditions along the way. But they don't wait. They get started now and find their way. An example of that comes from Jessica Matthew. Jessica was born in Nigeria. She came to the U.S. to attend university, and about a year later, she went back home to attend her aunt's wedding. The wedding was going great. Everything was fine until the power went out. Well, this is a common occurrence, not only in Nigeria, but in many developing countries. You have an old-school power system that simply can't keep up with current demand. So what do they do? In this case, they do what they've always done. They fire up the diesel generators. The party continues, but Jessica and the other guests, they're now breathing in these exhaust fumes. Well, as her lungs are burning and as she's choking, she says, there has to be a better way. And then she says something really cool. She says, I'm going to start before I'm ready. I'm going to go after it and see if I can make a difference. Now, she had no business saying that. She had no capital. She had no energy sector knowledge. She's a college kid. But she believed that she could find a way. The next day, because her curiosity was piqued, and she was watching some kids playing sports, she said, wow, look at the energy out on that field. What if I could capture that? Maybe I could power this whole town. So she grabs an engineering classmate of hers, a friend, and together they create something called the socket. The socket looks and plays just like a regular soccer ball, but inside it's actually a generator that's being driven with motion. In other words, one hour on the soccer field powers a light bulb for eight hours. Pretty cool. But she doesn't stop there. She says, all right, where else can I use the same thinking? Motion to create energy. Her next invention came pretty quick. Jump a little rope, charge your mobile device. Recognizing that she couldn't manufacture enough toys all by herself to change the world, she ended up starting her own company, licensing her technology to third-party manufacturers. For example, let's say a guest of yours, if, you, if, if one, any of you are in the hotel business, let's say a guest is pulling their roller bag through your lobby. Well, as those wheels are turning, it could be creating a clean, free, renewable source of power. So in this example, Jessica is making a real difference in the developing world, and she's created a pretty exciting company for herself. All tied to this core belief, start before you're ready. So the key insight for you is just don't wait. Start now and find your way. Now you might be saying starting now seems pretty scary and intimidating. Isn't that high risk? The way you de-risk starting now, starting before you're ready, is not by starting with big ideas, but again, starting by small ones. And I would encourage you to think of it as, as, as experiments. In fact, Jeff Bezos, of course, of Amazon fame, said our success at Amazon is a function of how many experiments we do per year, per month, per week, and per day. So again, the way you de-risk, because again, if you have an idea, you're like, oh man, if I try this with all of my hospitality guests, that's risky. Agreed, don't do that. Instead, if you have a little idea, try it with one guest on a Tuesday afternoon and see how it works. So the way that we, again, get innovation and creativity within our grasp at a low risk tolerance is through rapid experimentation. I hope that you're running experiments all the time. Fixed time, fixed money experiments. Low fidelity, crude experiments. What can you try for 20 bucks in 15 minutes? And when you think about your creative process, instead of these, put everything you've got on one idea, but trying lots and lots of small ones, running a lot of experiments, it it becomes liberating because, again, it gives you the confidence to start before you're ready. Today I'm going to share a couple ideas that are very practical, techniques that you can take and put into use in the months and years to come. Techniques right here from our Innovation Toolkit. And so the toolkit idea that I have for you right now is this. Many of you have a to-do list. I certainly do. But why not also have a to-test list? When you have a to-test list, what it does is it sort of encourages you to 
always keep a running tally of new ideas, big or small, crazy or not. And then on a given week, take a look and say, is there any of these ideas that I could test? Could I give them a, a shot? Again, fixed time, fixed money, crude experiment. It's a much more simple and pragmatic approach than betting your entire company or career on a particular idea. Okay, this brings us to our second core mindset of everyday innovators. Mindset number two, break it to fix it. Think what we've been taught for years. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And let me just say, that is terrible advice. I sure hope that your airline pilot isn't thinking that way, or your physician. I think we owe it to ourselves to examine the systems and processes and approaches that might be working just fine and deconstruct them, examine them, and look for better ways to put them back together, to upgrade them. Let's take a look at some break it to fiction in action, specifically in the hospitality industry. St. Regis Hotel, Washington, D.C. Like you, they're looking around saying, hey, how can we gain competitive advantage? How can we better care for our hospitality guests? So they start looking around the hotel, looking for things to change, and it leads them to the empty closet, the same closet that's in every hotel room around the world. But they look into this empty closet and said, wait a minute, maybe this is an opportunity. Even though it's working, maybe we can break it in order to fix it. Maybe we can give that closet an upgrade. So here's what they did. They partnered up with the luxury retailer, Neiman Marcus, and they created something spectacular. As a guest now, before you arrive, you're sent an email survey asking about your size and your fashion preferences. When you walk into your room and open up the closet, instead of being empty, it's filled with hand-selected goods just for you. Try them on in the privacy of your room. If you like it, walk off with it. auto bill to your hotel invoice. A little dangerous, perhaps. But let's think about what they did here. They activated a dead space. They created a new revenue stream. They did it with no capital since they partnered up with Neiman Marcus. Drove competitive advantage. Better cared for their hospitality guests. All because they had the courage to look at the empty closet that's working fine and imagine something more. In other words, they had the courage to break it in order to fix it. So I would ask you with great respect as you look around your business, maybe it is a closet, but maybe it's something else. What are those things that you just take for granted and say, that's just the way we've always done it. That's just the way it works in the hospitality industry. Maybe we, instead we should challenge ourselves to take a look at those, those tried and true approaches and, and find something better. Back to our innovation toolkit for a moment. Another technique for you, which I think is well, it's pretty fun, but also very productive. This one I simply call the judo flip. The judo flip. Here's how it works. Let's say you're trying to seize an opportunity or solve a new problem. You're trying to find a way. Start by taking an inventory. How have you always done it in the past? What, do, what, would, what would your previous uh, training suggest that you do? What does everybody else in the hospitality field do? Then, draw a line down the page. And next to every single entry, just simply ask, what's the polar opposite? What would it look like if you judo flipped it? Let's take a look at a judo flip in action. The folks at Nathan's Hot Dogs, every year they have this big hot dog eating contest on the 4th of July. The goal is to see how many hot dogs a contestant can eat in 12 minutes. And over the years, it's become very famous and the prize money is very big. So enter a guy named Takuru Kobayashi. Kobe saw his eye, he had his eye on that prize money. In fact, he didn't even like hot dogs, but he saw a chance to win some, some dough. So he said, all right, what can I do? How can I reimagine this whole approach? In other words, can I break it in order to fix it? Can I give the way you eat a hot dog a judo flip? So here's what he does. First, he starts experimenting. He run, ran dozens of experiments. Most of them didn't work, but some started to show some promise. He separates the meat from the bun. And through experimentation, he realized that he could take that meat, fold it in half, and sort of down it in one gulp. The bun was giving him a hard time until he tried a new idea. He tried dunking it in a glass of water that contestants are allowed, squishing out the excess liquid and downing it in one gooey gulp. Keep in mind, he's eating here for sport, not for pleasure. Well, here are the results. After, uh, before he tried this on his first attempt, for 90 years in a row, the worldwide record was 25.1 hot dogs eaten in 12 minutes, which is disgusting. On Kobayashi's first attempt, he ate 50, which is, of course, more disgusting. But you can't argue with the results. He doubled the worldwide record. Not because he tried harder. 
not because he worked fa uh, faster, not because he worked longer hours. It's because he broke it in order to fix it. He judo flipped the very way that you eat a hot dog. And if he can do that, think what you can do in your business. Okay, this brings us to our third big idea for today. Idea number three, use every drop of toothpaste. This is an observation that I've had with innovators around the world. And it struck me one day when I was traveling in a hotel and I was squishing out my little travel size toothpaste, every little drop. And I said, that's kind of what innovators do. They make the most of the resources at their disposal. They don't rely on external resources, but they, they get scrappy. They use their grit and determination and tenacity and creativity rather than just needing to write a big check. So for you, using every drop of toothpaste is around using whatever resources you have in the most creative manner. Let's take a look at some examples. First, I'll share this. I actually started my career as a jazz guitarist. In fact, I was playing a little bit last night, 40 years, 40 plus years later. And, and I ended up putting myself through college playing music. I had a professor that would force me to remove strings from the instrument. In other words, I would have to take off one, two, sometimes three strings from the guitar. Well, you figure if your resources were cut in half, your creativity is going to tank. But this surprising thing happened. When those strings were off, I could no longer rely on the patterns that I knew. I was forced to solve musical problems in a fresh way. And in fact, my creativity skyrocketed. So for you, even if you find yourself in the inevitable situation of not enough um, inventory, not enough staff, not enough linens, whatever, you might say to yourself, okay, how can I use my inner set of creativity to drive even better results? Which reminded me of one of my all-time favorite heroes, MacGyver. You'll probably remember from the show that this guy always found himself in a jam. And he didn't have a bunch of resources, but he always figured it out. In his case, most often with like some duct tape and a paper clip. He's, as mentioned, become one of my heroes and also the hero to many. In fact, he's now part of the English language. The Oxford Dictionary defines MacGyvering as a verb to make or repair something in an improvised or inventive way, making use of whatever items are at hand. Or my favorite one, the Urban Dictionary defines a MacGyver as a noun, someone who can jumpstart a truck with a cactus. Point being, what if we brought our inner MacGyver to work? When we, we find ourselves in a resource-constrained situation, instead of throwing up our arms in defeat, let's challenge ourselves to make do with what we've got, to use every drop of toothpaste. So how does this look in hospitality? There's an interesting little hotel in Orlando, Florida called the Magic Castle, unaffiliated with the Disney Corporation. Now, by all uh, objective measures, this hotel is, is identical to many other in this price category. Same kind of location, same price point, same bedding, same offering. Everything is the same. So they said, how do we stand out? How do we drive competitive advantage? How can, is there something we could use, a small amount of resources, to gain competitive ad advantage? Well, here's what they did. Outside by the pool, there's a popsicle hotline. In other words, here's, a, here's how it works. This little girl picks up the red phone. There's not even a dial on the phone, but someone on the other end says, oh, what flavor? Let's say she says grape. Within minutes, a, a staff member comes out with a silver platter wearing white gloves and presents the grape popsicle to this young lady. That's it. Now, in, keep in mind, the, the cost of operating their popsicle hotline compared to the overall cost structure of their real estate costs and their staffing and their insurance and their marketing, this is negligible but it makes all the difference in the world. This little dose of creativity, in this case, this holiday world, or the uh, Magic Castle Hotel has like 10 times the Yelp reviews of their competitors. And when other hotels in this price category are, are, are running short on guests, these, one, these guys are always full. So my point to you is let's find little creative ways that don't require huge investments that drive meaningful results. Okay, this brings us to our fourth big idea, our fourth core mindset of everyday innovators as you look to find your way. This one is one of my favorites, reach for weird. The notion is this, many of us, we, we tend to gravitate toward the obvious solutions, the tried and true. But instead, let's challenge ourselves to find those bizarre, unorthodox, unexpected ideas, because those are the ones that create, can create the biggest impact. I know we all have those inside of us right now. Let's bring them to the surface, let's reach for weird. Small little village in Iceland was facing a problem. Traffic incidents involving pedestrians <clears throat> were up 12% over the last 10 years. 
So they didn't want this to continue to happen. They needed to solve the problem. What are they going to do? Well, you could install more traffic lights. You could hire more police officers. You could issue more fines. Or you could reach for weird. In this case, they painted the crosswalk as an optical illusion. So as cars drive up, it looks like these slabs are floating three feet in the air. There's no way you're going to barrel through that intersection when you're driving your car. Traffic incidents dropped to almost zero. And they got to have some fun taking selfies. A little weird in action. What about this one? Do you ever go to the market and you're faced with an insolvable problem? Do you buy the yellow bananas or the green ones? If you buy the yellow bananas, they're pretty good today, but four days later, the rest of the bunch is all mushy. If you buy the green bananas, you have to wait like a month to have a decent banana. Well, now imagine that you were in the banana business instead of hospitality. Well, what would you do? I mean, that's just how bananas are after all. Well, here's what happened when one company in Korea decided to reach for weird. Check out their bananas. They're organized by ripeness. So what happens here is that as each day goes on, your next banana is perfectly ripe just for that day. Same bananas, weird approach to market. And here's what happened. First of all, crushing the competition in terms of sales volume. Second of all, they're charging three times per ounce of banana compared to the competitive set. An absolute game changer. All because this company decided to reach for weird. Back in our innovation toolkit, here's a simple way that you can reach for weird. When we're trying to solve a problem or seize a new, new opportunity, we generally are coming up with ideas, but we quickly make it a short list. In other words, we go from unlimited possible ideas to like three or four. In other words, it's usually A, B, or C. Your A, B, and C ideas, those are the ones grounded in historical reference, things you've always done in the past. We pick our best one and we go. Instead, try this. Instead of choosing A, B, or C, just pause. Say, wait a minute. Is there a D? I haven't considered, is there an E? Or maybe there's what I like to call an option X. Option X are those bold, provocative, unexpected ideas. Painting your crosswalk like a 3D optical illusion, option X. Organizing bananas by ripeness, option X. Dressing up window washers like superheroes at a children's hospital, you guessed it, option X. Okay, let's take a look at our fifth and final big idea for today, core mindset of everyday innovators. This one, fall seven times, stand eight. I borrowed the phrase from a Japanese proverb, but here's the way I interpret it. First of all, it's recognizing that setbacks, mistakes, failed experiments, that's just part of the process. In other words, we're never going to innovate in the way that we all hope and want if we have no tolerance for, for failure. So let's just own it, know what it is, and that's part of the process. Second of all, it's not just getting back up in the same way and trying again and again and again. It's not dogged persistence, but rather each time we find ourselves in the inevitable situation of getting knocked down, we find a new creative way to get back up. Yeah, we're going to fall seven times, but together let's stand eight. To showcase the role that innovation plays, or that, that failure plays in the innovative process, I want to take you to Sweden to the Museum of Failure. An organizational psychologist there wanted to create, uh, really reinforce the principle that, that it takes some failures to get breakthrough innovation. So he created a museum to showcase some of these failures. Let's take a peek inside. Here's a fun one for you. Many of us drink flavor or vitamin enhanced water. Well, some inventor thought that our pets would probably like the same thing. They have thirsty cat and thirsty dog comes in crisp, uh, tangy fish and crispy beef flavor. And as a surprise to no one other than the inventor, this was not a commercial success. What about this one? I think appetite suppressant candy is a good idea, but I think they maybe blew it on the name. Can you imagine? Hey, honey, when you're out at the store, can you just pick me up a couple packs of AIDS? Yeah, that'd be great. Again, not a big commercial hit. But my all-time favorite has to be this. It's called the Euro Club. It's for the golfer that simply can't hold it for nine holes. In other words, it's a urinal disguised as a golf club. It fits conveniently in your golf bag. even comes with a privacy towel. Well, of course, this was also a failure, but in a surpri surprising twist of fate, it's still available online as a gag gift. So here's the thing. When we look at these, we, we laugh. Our heart goes out for these inventors who, who tried, at least. But when we screw something up ourselves, we give ourselves no such compassion. 
My suggestion is this. Let's, again, recognizing the important role that those setbacks and failures play as part of the process of winning, and let's give ourselves a little bit of love when we screw something up. Let's dust ourselves off, get back in the fight with a little bit more creativity, and that combination will ultimately allow us to win. Key insight here is that mistakes are not fun in the moment, but mistakes, setbacks, and failures, that's what fuels discovery. Back to our friend in London, Trellin Resterick, the guy with the yellow ballot bins. I was asking him, hey, now that you've enjoyed some success, how do you keep your team motivated? How do you keep your team continuing to push the creative boundaries, recognizing that they might make some mistakes? He told me about a really fun ritual that he does every Friday. Every Friday, Trellin and his team have something they call F Up Fridays. <coughs> now, of course, they say the whole, whole word. I'll just be polite here today. But here's what happens. He brings the entire company together for a full company brown bag lunch session. Each person has to stand up one after the other and proudly share what did they F up that week and what did they learn from it. When they get to someone that didn't F something up that week, they're like, well, why not? What are you going to try next week? So the simple approach, the simple ritual, think about the message that it sends to the team about taking responsible risk about leaning into your creativity, about recognizing that mistakes and failures are part of the process and that the company and the leaders have the back of the employees. I mean, a simple ritual like this, whether you adopt this one or something like it, can make a huge difference encouraging you, th those around you to, again, take responsible risk, to get creative, to find a way. Okay, we've covered five big ideas for you today, the five core mindsets of everyday innovation. Let me just again remind you that the research is so clear that we all are creative. We all have the capacity to uh, inject inventive thinking and creative problem solving to drive better outcomes in our work. I'm not suggesting that you run down the hall and paint uh, on the walls with purple crayons. I'm suggesting instead that you think about your creativity as an asset. The same way you might think about bed linens as an asset or, or dinner plates as an asset. And let's build that asset. Let's develop those skills for you and those around you and ultimately to drive meaningful results. So with that in mind, I'd like to share one final story that embodies all five of these core principles. It's a hospitality-driven story, but I think you're going to appreciate it because it's the story of a guy named Jesse Cole. I've gotten to know Jesse uh, over the years. In fact, I'm speaking to him again this Friday. But Jesse is uh, looking very dapper here in his yellow tuxedo and his yellow Curious George hat. But it wasn't always so smiley. In fact, at 23 years old, Jesse Cole was flat broke. This guy was running on fumes and really unsure of his future. He always had a dream, though, and his dream was to be somehow involved in professional sports management. His real dream, which seemed completely out of reach, is that wouldn't it be amazing someday if Jesse were able to own a professional sports team. But the problem is he wasn't a billionaire trust fund kid. This guy, again, he, he, was, he was really running short on resources. But he heard about something really interesting happening in Savannah, Georgia. He learned that the minor league baseball team in Savannah, Georgia was about to go bankrupt. They played at the historic Grayson Stadium here behind me, and it was crumbling. It was, it was in terrible shape. In fact, only a couple dozen fans showed up to every game, usually the families of the players. So he learned about this team that was just a disaster. Instead of just rolling his eyes, he said, maybe there's an opportunity here. Maybe I can find a way. So he gets into his rusted out old car. He drives a thousand miles down to Savannah, Georgia to show up to the bankruptcy hearing. He's the only guy that showed. No other right-minded person wanted the team, so Jesse got his shot. The city council gave him a chance to make something better of the team. At that point, what else did they have to lose? But again, Jesse really was in over his head. He didn't have the resources, experience, context that he, that he needed to, to make a go of it. So instead of turning to those external resources, he decided to double down on what we've talked about today, the five core obsessions, core mindsets of everyday innovators. First, he had, he said, obviously, he started before he was ready. He didn't have a plan. He didn't have capital lined up. This guy didn't really know what he was doing. But he saw the opportunity and said, I'm going to seize it, and I'll figure it out as I go. I'm going to find my way as I go. Next, he had to break it in order to fix it. Jesse told me that he and his team, even today, years later, meticulously study the game of baseball, looking from a fan perspective, looking at every single spot where something is boring, something is uncomfortable, a fan is waiting in line, any type of friction, they want to remove it. 
And Jesse had the courage to challenge conventional wisdom, to take what has always been done in baseball and flip it upside down, to judo flip to new possibilities. Obviously, Jesse was short on resources, so he had to use every drop of toothpaste. In fact, Jesse and his wife sold everything they owned, including their house, and slept on an air mattress in that stadium for over a year while they were getting the team up and running. He had to reach for weird. As you saw, he was wearing a bright yellow tuxedo. He wears one seven days a week. That's his uniform. That's his go time example. And, and you'll see in a minute, he did a lot of other weird things along the way. And it wasn't easy. He got a lot of criticism. He had a number of setbacks. It never is easy. For when we look at people that are successful, we think like they had some idea, they got out of the shower, a limousine was waiting, and they were whisked off to fame and fortune. That's not the case, and certainly wasn't for Jesse. In fact, he kept getting knocked down, but he kept getting back up with more creativity and never lost his passion and his vision and his sense of creative purpose. So here's what happens for Jesse Cole. First, he renames the team the Savannah Bananas. A lot of people hated the name, but nobody could forget it. I mean, it rhymed, it was fun, it was playful. It already told you that you're in for something different. Next, as mentioned, he studied the aspect of baseball and realized that there were some slow moments, especially like between innings. So one thing that he does is he trains his entire team to do choreographed dance routines to blaring pop music to entertain the fans. Back to experimentation, Jesse tells me that every single night is like an experimental lab. Every single night he's trying something new. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. He's tried ones uh, where if, if a game is going on too long, he'll grab a fan from the audience and let them bat. He's done things where if uh, change the rules, where if a fan catches a pop-up, then, then, the, then the runner is out. He's trying some things they work, some things they don't work, but he's always experimenting and pushing the creative boundaries. He's breaking it to fix it. Another fun example of this is the cheerleaders. Instead of objectifying young women in bikinis cheering on the team, Jesse has the Savannah Nanas, which is a team of senior citizen ladies cheering the team on, the Savannah Nanas. But he didn't want to be sexist, so he also has the dad bod cheerleading squad. I mean, how clever, how fun. What ends up happening, though, is that people start to fall in love. Before long, people start showing up to the game dressed up as giant bananas. Jesse tells me it's rarely a game goes by where someone doesn't come up to Jesse and show him a brand new tattoo of the team's logo. I mean, again, this team was falling apart, but now people are tattooing the logo on their body because Jesse applied these principles of creativity. And there he is. Every game shows up like P.T. Barnum, entertaining the fans in his yellow tuxedo. And the fans start to show up in droves. In fact, Jesse told me that he's sold out every single seat for the last 100 games, all 4,000 seats. And there's now a waiting list a mile long to get season tickets. This has become a national phenomenon. And in fact, he told me recently that he's now expanding the team. They, they go on the road. He just did one in like Mobile, Alabama with an incredible sold out crowd. Wall Street Journal is covering the, uh, his, his, his antics. And he's got this wildly successful business. And here's the cool part. He didn't really focus on the baseball. He focused on the fan experience. But the team, because there was so much energy going on, starts playing better. And what ended up happening is that Jesse led his team to a national championship. This is the power of creative thinking, of, in, of, of creative problem solving and inventive thinking in action. This is the power that you have within your grasp right now. I know we've had a tough year coming out of COVID, but now as we, as we emerge in the post-COVID world, the hospita hospitality business is ready for a comeback. And just like Jesse Cole, we're ready to do amazing things together if we're able to deploy our gift of human creativity. So coming into today's session, perhaps you thought this was the face of innovation, Elon Musk. But I hope that I've now convinced you that these are the faces of innovation. And in fact, we are the faces of innovation. Together, every one of us can become an everyday innovator, and we can make a real difference seizing the big, bold opportunities ahead, one big little breakthrough at a time. So speaking of big little breakthroughs, as we say goodbye today, and I know we've got a lot of other exciting item, items on the agenda here at the InnoFact uh, show conference. But here's my challenge for you. While these ideas are still fresh in your mind, in the next seven days, see if you can discover just one big little breakthrough, just one. I don't even have, you don't even have to execute it next week. All I want you to do is think about it. And I know that all of us can come forward with one small idea that might make a small difference. 
Here's why I think you should try it. First of all, it's going to be pretty easy. Even after today, I'm sure you're already thinking of new ideas. But if you give yourself permission to get a little unorthodox, to, to start before you're ready, to break it, to fix it, to, to get weird, to reach for weird, what will happen is that these ideas are start, going to start to come in high frequency. In other words, one idea becomes 14 ideas, becomes 38 ideas. And then this new creative energy, it'll spill over to those around you. And before long, you're not only an everyday innovator, but those around you are as well. If you give this a start next week with one big little breakthrough, that's going to be that first step of a journey that will lead to incredible results. Listen, I know we're living in unprecedented times. I know it's difficult. I know we've had one heck of a year. But going forward, the opportunities remain bright. And our best days can be yet to come if we're willing to deploy our creativity. So let's do it. Let's push the creative boundaries. Let's use inventive thinking and creative problem solving to find a way. Let's double down on our imagination. Let's harness this incredible, beautiful gift that we all have. And in turn, again, we're going to be able to seize the enormous opportunities waiting for us in the hospitality industry. Once again, my friends at Innofact, thank you so much. It's been a privilege to be with you. Wishing you tremendous success and a lot of creativity going forward.